Here. Maddox? Here. Gary? Here. Morley? Yes. Garage? Bryant? Brewer? Here we go. Okay, um, moving on to approval of agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Second. Thank you. So, please. <coughs> Josh has said it well uh, during his presentation of, uh, about how it takes a whole village uh, to be successful. And, and certainly with athletics, there are numerous people to thank uh, in order to give our students the opportunity to participate and uh, be able to play the sports that they play. Uh, pretty much everybody in this room, I can say thank you to. Uh, you know, but I did want to take a couple minutes just to say thanks to, and, and recognize a lot of people that are involved in athletics. And it starts with uh, our coaches. Our, our coaches put in hours upon hours of, of time and dedication that they really uh, go above and beyond. And, and they go above and beyond uh, for the kids, not just because they want to win ball games, but they go because they know what it makes a difference in kids' lives. Uh, they're there to build relationships with the kids, they're there to support them academically, to support them in all that they do. And sports just happen to be a conduit very proud of our, our coaches for what they do. Uh, again, you know, I can go on and on, uh, you know, whether the facilities and, 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 the, and the job that Lenny and Adam do, uh, you know, the, the help we get from tech, the help we get from everybody in the finance department, from uh, the HR, we, we go through uh, hiring a number of assistant coaches and assistant coaches year in and year out as part of the process. Uh, my administrative teams and all they do to help support us and, and supervise games, our, our workers for games, uh, John, our athletic trainer, for those of you know John, he puts in, uh, he's, he's always on call, he's, he's always available. And uh, I know, I can only tell you how much the kids appreciate all that he does for them. Uh, our custodial staffs, uh, our, our secretarial staffs, Emily, my uh, administrative assistant, uh, she, she does a phenomenal job. Uh, of course, uh, my family at home because uh, I'm blessed to have a wife and kids that understand uh, the, the time it, it takes to do this job and, and, and they get it, they're in the life and they understand and so I'm, I'm very blessed there. So uh, it's hard to say thank you to everybody. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing people, but uh, I just wanted to recognize that when you talk about athletics, you're really talking about something that impacts a lot of people in a lot of ways and we have and everybody shares some involvement in that, whether they realize it or not. Had an opportunity this year to sit down with our coaches and have some conversations about what it means to be a Glenwood Titan athlete and what, our, what is our shared vision for uh, being a participant in, in athletics in, in the Ball Chatham School District. And, and through this process, we developed a definition of, of a Titan student athlete. We also developed uh, new mission and new vision statements, and we put down our philosophy <coughs> of educational based <coughs> athletics, which we'll, we'll share on our website uh, here in the near future and be able to share with, with parents. Uh, we'll have a fall sports meeting coming up here in August, and that'll be our first opportunity to really uh, send that out and, and share it. I'm not going to obviously read all that to you right now. I did put it in the, the board report, but I did want to share the, the definition of a Glenwood Titan student athlete. A person of incredible character, selfless dedication, and relentless determination. 
very proud of, uh, of the work my coaches did uh, for us to create the, this kind of living, breathing document that, that we can we go back to and say, this is our shared vision for what it means to be Glenwood Titan athlete. So during the 2018-19 school year, a lot, a lot of stuff happened. Uh, a lot of great things. Uh, had a lot of contests. Participated in a lot of sporting events. Over 860 contests. Almost 600 at the high school and over 260 at the middle school. Number of them were home games. You'll never see those home games typically be a, a truly half and half. And the reason being is because of a lot of tournaments, postseason tournaments, things we go to. So that's why it's never going to be a true 50 50 split with home and away games. We hosted 16 postseason contests this year. Eight at the high school <laughs> between regional, sectionals, and playoffs. and eight at the middle school between regionals and sections. And the reason we do this is very simple. And we don't do this to make money. We do this because it benefits the kids. It gives the kids an opportunity to succeed. Some of these we'll make some money off of, and some of these we really won't make much money off of. Uh, after the IHSA and the IESA take the, the fair share. Uh, but the reality is, is we do this because we think it gives kids an opportunity to to compete in an environment they're comfortable in and be successful. And our participation numbers had almost 500 student athletes at the high school and 344 student athletes at the middle school participate in at least one uh, sport this year. 111 coaches between the high school and middle school. 51 paid at the high school, 27 volunteer, and 28 paid at the middle school, and 5 volunteer. So my report's broken up into two sections. It's broken up into the, the high school and the middle school. So I'll start with the high school, and I want to talk to you a little bit about just some of the overall successes of the high school, and then I'll talk a little bit about the participation numbers, and I'll discuss our, some of the finances that go along with our gaming seats as well. 23 varsity sports in 43 separate levels. If you're looking back to last year's report, or if you had a chance to do that, you notice these numbers are a little different from last year. That's because this was our first year for eSports, which at this point is an activity. And uh, it's an emoji sport with the IHSA, so it's, it's not an adopted IHSA sport as of yet, but it is moving in that direction. Our IHSA enrollment, the 1819 school year is 1403. That IHSA enrollment is based on the September 30th enrollment from the previous year. So when I run our participation numbers and I uh, and I calculate out the percentages, those aren't based on 1403. They're based on this year's student population because those are this year's students participating. But in terms of classification for the IHSA, we go up at 1403. 40% of our boys and 30% of our girls participated in athletics. So 44% of our overall athletes were <coughs> female athletes this year. Some of the highlights, we have three varsity sports that won CSA championships this year. We have finished in second place this year in the All Activity Award. You high won that and in your reports I didn't put the, the complete standings. One state champion, boys cross country, one second place trophy to the athletes with disabilities, uh, boys swim and dive. We have five regional championships, one playoff group, three sectional championships, and we had multiple teams and individuals qualify for state. Overall, very successful. Very successful. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Some of our participation numbers. Technical difficulty on this one. I think it's. I have it broken. No, I'll have it broken down in these next slides. Um, so this first this first gra uh, chart here shows our fall participation numbers. As you notice, 2018-19 at the bottom we had 316 students uh, participate. 
uh, average is 333. So our, our participation numbers are down a little this year across the board. Uh, and I'll touch a little, I'll summarize that a little bit more in a minute. A couple of the things you, you may notice if you, if you looked at any closer at this is that the, the sport that we saw the biggest decline from last year to this year uh, in the fall was volleyball. We did see uh, some growth in some other areas, uh, and, and I'll touch on those. The biggest one was in the spring, and I'll touch on track in just a minute. Uh, participation in the fall sports overall is down, uh, but it's not just here. It's in other, other schools as well. And I think that's the biggest thing I want, I want to put across is that uh, participation numbers in a lot of schools is down. To give you an example, there are four schools in our conference right now that have dropped freshman football for next year, but for this coming year. There are three teams that will not have JV soccer this fall. Jacksonville is, a is not going to play a full a sophomore, uh, excuse me, freshman volleyball schedule this year. They're going to play just a few select games. So numbers are a concern. Do, do you, are the numbers in, in GHS, though, are they down because fewer kids are trying out? Or are they down because uh, more kids are being cut from teams? No, or that would be simple. It's not more kids are being cut. No, no we, we're, not, we're not shrinking the, the size of our teams. Um, and one of the things like go to meetings with other superintendents and other districts. <clears throat> Number one is concussion. We're seeing a lot of parents who are just not allowing their kids to play. And overall sports injuries, it's just not concussion. So across the board, we're seeing statistical decline. We are. And that's what their share is. In, in our football numbers there aren't, aren't bad. Uh, you'll notice at the middle school, though, there is a little bit more of a job off, so you're starting to see uh, what Dr. Wood was talking about those concerns show up more in youth sports. And, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are a ton of different things we can speculate as to why, and it's, a, it's really a combination of a lot of different things. Uh, if we look into the, the winter sports here, the one that step, uh, stands out, I think, is an area of concern is girls basketball, our participation numbers in girls basketball. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, the concern, it's not, again, it's not an art concern, it's a, it, it's a concern across the area. We had last year 10 freshman girls basketball games, we had to cancel eight of them. Not just because of our numbers, but because of the numbers of other schools. So that is a concern. We'll look, when we look at the GMS numbers, though, our GMS girls basketball numbers last year actually went up a little bit. So we're hoping that that trend starts to reverse a little bit. Oh, and there's the esports down there. This is, being, this is the first year we offered esports. We had 24 kids participate in esports. And esports in its first year, uh, Keith Kennedy volunteered to be the esports coach this year. Did a great job. Got a lot of kids involved. Got a lot of kids excited in it. And he ran two teams. He ran, uh, the, they have different games. So he's got a varsity team playing League of Legends, and he's got a varsity team uh, playing um, Overwatch. And then he's got JV teams playing those games as well. And then he's looking at a third game for this upcoming year also. Spring sports, the numbers that stand out here to me, track, boys track, girls track, uh, went up quite a bit. It's really, boys track really jumped up this year. It had taken a, a, a bit of a dip last year, and then we saw those numbers really come up this year. Um, yeah, Coach Cox, is, is, this is his second year now in the program, and he, he's really trying to uh, create that multi-sport approach, getting kids from other sports to participate in track, and I, and I believe that has uh, benefited him with his numbers. Bass fishing did go down a little bit this year. This is only our, our second year where we've tracked the numbers of bass fishing. Bass fishing was here before I got here, but the numbers weren't being tracked, so we started tracking them last year. And so I don't have enough data to really tell you if that's a trend. If we had a spike last year, I, I couldn't tell you for sure. So again, 
even though our numbers are only down eight from last year, I think the overall trend is participation numbers across the board, not just with Glenwood, but with a lot of schools that see declines in their numbers. Um, now, what are we doing to try and alleviate that? Well, the biggest thing that we're doing is we're trying to get our coaches to work together. We're trying to get them to collaborate. Uh, one of the things our PE department has done that, that, that I think they've done a really nice job of is they've invested in platform, which is uh, uh, synchronized, it's a web-based program for their, their workouts and their, and their conditioning program that they use uh, in the PE classes. But it also, our coaches use it. And now it gives a chance for our coaches and our PE teachers to all talk, all be on the same page. Whereas before, maybe the football coach wanted uh, a workout to be done with his football kids not knowing what they're doing in uh, basketball workouts or after school or with uh, the PE class. Now everybody's on the same page, see the same thing. So while we're sharing athletes, we can see what athletes are doing and the workouts that they're doing. And we can construct workouts that benefit them so that we're not wearing athletes down during one of their seasons, but yet we're giving them the best opportunities to be fresh and, and strong and healthy and conditioned so that they can be successful in multiple sports. Participation numbers by grade. The, the taller, uh, taller columns on the chart, the ones with the percentages by them, those are the overall numbers for each grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Uh, then it's broken down even more by boys and girls. You'll see that the, the, the class that has the, the least amount of overall participation is this year's junior class, so our senior class coming into this next school year uh, has a lower participation rate. The freshmen are typically always gonna be the highest Participants, there is that natural attrition that happens over the course of four years. Kids try more sports, and then they, as they, they get older, uh, we're going to doubt with those kids that no longer are interested in participating. And I think this is interesting. We talk a lot about multi sport athletes, and, and we certainly love multi sport athletes. Generations ago, multi-sport athletes meant three sports to a lot of people. And that's really not typically the case today. You see 6% of our athletes are three sport athletes. 70% of our kids are one sport athlete. When we talk with coaches and we talk with athletes, uh, we, we talk about you know multi-sport realistically in, in today's age with all the demands and all the off-season demands and all the club and travel team demands. If we get kids to play two sports, we love the idea of kids playing these two sports. And these multi-sport uh, charts for the high school are very similar to the ones you'll see for the middle school. Any questions on participation before I go to uh, budget numbers? <laughs> So these are gate receipts from this year. And every year when I, when I get up here and talk about gate receipts, I put that little asterisk down at the bottom and talk about football. Because football is, is such a different character when it comes to our gate receipts. It has such a huge impact on the overall amount. Last and every year changes a little bit because we have one year where we have five home football games and those opponents that we play in those years are bringing in a lot of fans. And then in the other years, the off years, we have four home football games, and it just so happens that the opponents that we play in those years don't bring in as many fans typically. So this past year, the 18-19 year, we have four home football games. This year, we'll have five home football games, and included in those five home football games are SHG, Rochester, Springfield, Southeast, and then MacArthur, who has really turned their program around. So it is well within reason to expect much bigger gates when I come back to you next year in the same report. On the more detailed report you provided, uh -huh. on page 13, it gave a breakdown of year over year of gates. Mm -hmm. It looked like every other year, like you're saying, and that's attributed to the football. Yeah, it's that cycle. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And we've even talked to the conference. I mean, the, the reality is, I think, uh, how it, it probably should have been set up years ago and it wasn't was that because uh, Rochester, Sacred Heart Griffin, and us, we all travel really well. We all affect each other's gates quite a bit. So it should have been set up where we have one at home and one away each year to kind of balance that. But when those rotations were set up, they didn't do it that way, and nobody's going to play on the road two years in a row. Now, you may ask, why is spring so, so little? We just don't have a lot of opportunities to charge at the gate in spring. The soccer is the only, the only sport that takes a gate. And you may ask, well, why don't we take a gate in, in softball or, or baseball? Uh, Conference-wide, we don't take gates at those games. We don't take gates at uh, just regular dual track meets. Uh, and again, that's keeping in consistency with, with the rest of the conference. And because a lot of our baseball and softball games are not necessarily in school settings, but they're park settings, some of the, the physical limitations of being able to take the gate uh, make that challenging. Season ticket sales, a little disappointed in in the decline in season ticket sales. Uh, and so we have a plan to, to try and bring that up this year because they are down a little bit. And one of the questions we would get asked, do you take debit card, do you take credit card, can we buy these online? And, and we didn't really have a way to do that. Mm -hmm. So last year, one in our last football game, um, we, we sampled a, a mobile uh, ticketing method. And one that didn't cost us money at the distance. And uh, it seemed to, to be pretty easy to use. Uh, it's through GoFan, and uh, it was easy for our ticket takers to look at our phone, uh, you know, hit the activation button, and allow the, the user to go into the game. So this year, after setting it up with the company uh, and working with Josh, we put it on our registration page. So now when everybody's registering for school, they're going to have the opportunity to buy a mobile ticket pass, and it's their season pass. And so they can, through this registration process, they can go ahead and do it, they pay with the credit card, and now they just show up in a game with the mobile ticket. Uh, we also, we have student council uh, members come to me and say, hey, we want to do something where we can get some more students in games. Talk to and they said, well, what if we did like a discount type of card, like a punch card type of thing? So Dr. Wood and I talked a little bit, and what we ended up coming up with is this mobile device is a safe and secure way of doing it, um, and it keeps it keeps somebody from going in the back and punching a couple holes and walking in the free game. Uh, so we're gonna, we've also, as part of this offer, the, the students uh, uh, buy four games, get the fifth game free thing. And I know that's not a huge discount, but it, it, it's just, we're going to try it and see where it goes, and, and we'll learn from that and, and have more information for next year. Again, I'm not quite sure why some of these went dark uh, on, on a couple of these screens. Do you want me to switch over real quick? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. So I thought it was interesting, uh, I, I haven't talked about this in years past, but I want to talk about the, the classification system that the IHSA uses. And they've changed it a little bit. Uh, it used to be that every year uh, our classification was based on the, years, the year before its enrollment, like I talked about. Starting this year, it'll be based on a two-year average. Right? And the IHSA, not only are they basing it on a two-year average, which our two-year average for the next two years will be 1392. But in addition to that, they, they looked at the classes and they adjusted them slightly. And so I highlighted uh, the classes uh, that I wanted to, and you'll notice some of our sports play in one class, some of us play in two, three, four, and then football is eight. The reason I have football highlighted because it's to be determined. Every year it's to be determined because football uh, is, does not automatically go into a postseason. You have to qualify for the postseason, so not every high school will participate in the playoffs, so they do not determine the classes until that the regular season is over. Two years ago, we were 5A. Last year, we were 6A. Uh, we we're kind of one of those on the bubble type teams. And uh, for now, if you have questions about districts, I can answer those uh, But for now, uh, we were, we're at a 5A, 6A bubble in the regular playoffs. 
volleyball, boys basketball, and girls basketball. We've been 4A for the last few years. And let me tell you, 4A is, is challenging. It, it, it's very difficult. Uh, when you run into the Edwardsville's of the world and in our regional, they're big schools. Uh, we're one of the smaller 4A schools, one of the smallest. Because of this new classification system uh, and the, the adjustments that just they made, we'll now be 3A instead of 4A. And that, starting this year. Starting this year. And that, that's going to be very beneficial. We would have loved to have seen it in a couple other sports. The track is one that stands out. Track is uh, 3A and track is, is, is a steep hill to climb. Um, one thing I, wanted, I also want to point out, you'll notice sometimes you'll see two sports who you would think would have the same number of classes that don't. Boys and girls golf, for example. Boys golf has three classes, girls golf has two classes. The reason that is is the number of schools participating in that sport. So there are more schools participating in boys golf than in girls golf. Therefore, the IHA has broken it up into three classes instead of two. sports. We have students participating from fifth grade on up to eighth grade. Some of the highlights. Won four regionals this year. Eight sectionals. Got a state championship team. Our uh, 8AA boy, boys track and field team. Won state. We had a second place finish in state with U.S. wrestling. A third place finish in state with our seventh, seventh grade girls team. A fourth place finish in state with baseball. Fifth place finish with boys and girls across country. We had two individual state champs, Alex Hamrick and Caitlin Lanin. We had two relays that won. Our, our eighth grade boys, four by two and four by four. Relays both won state championships. And then we had a number of individuals that were state qualifiers as well. Um, it's always fun to get up here and, and have a long list of uh, team and individual <laughs> state trophy winners. Uh, so that's, uh, it's fun to bring those trophies home and uh, really, we'll run, we're starting to run out of room. If you fail with the middle school and walk down that front hallway recently, the, the trophy case is getting pretty full, and that's a, that's a good problem to have. Participation numbers, I think this is this is really cool. Um, I, I didn't make this up. 172 boys and 172 girls participated in this one. So. Uh, IESA enrollment. Uh, for last year, it was 743, it'll be 728 this, this coming year. And while we're one of the, uh, you know, like when I said we were in 4 a in, in the last couple of years in, in boys and girls basketball in the high school, and that was one of the smaller 4 a's we are one of the bigger middle schools in the state. Uh, we're, we're bigger than a lot of the suburban middle schools. And a lot of that is because we, those high schools have multiple middle schools feeding into the high school. But uh, we have a very big uh, seventh and eighth grade. Here's a breakdown of numbers for our middle school sports. A couple things that I, I'll point out with those numbers is the wrestling did uh, go up quite a bit this year. And last year was our first year with fifth grade wrestling. And so this year we had uh, a number of fifth graders that went out for wrestling. So that was a, a nice influx in, in wrestlers this year. I mentioned earlier girls basketball. Uh, you can see that the numbers went up, and, and that's good. Um, we're glad to see that. Um, football, uh, as Dr. Wood talked about, those numbers did go down a little bit this year for those school level. <laughs> I think it's interesting that uh, the, the sport that we saw a lot of decline, boys and girls track, but we still have huge numbers. And you look at the success we've had this year, um, you know, I, Coach Wall and his staff, they do a great job of making that such a welcoming environment that we, would, we get a ton of kids involved in sports, um, involved in track, but uh, the numbers did go down some this year. Again, 40, overall reduction was 40 spots. Most significant are boys and girls track, 
uh, wrestling, I said, you know, did go up, and then um, hopefully it goes basketball. I was saying that we made time. So this is our participation numbers. Fifth graders only have the option of doing wrestling right now. Sixth graders have the option of uh, participating in cross country, wrestling, volleyball, and track. We did have, we do not have golf at the middle school level. We did have an individual that participated in golf. And so we, we've got a couple that are interested in participating as individuals uh, this year. Uh, it should be noted that uh, we had two kids participate in bowling at the high school level this year as individuals, and we had one uh, participate in bowling at the middle school level as well. When I showed this chart at the high school, I showed three sport athletes. You'll notice here at the middle school, uh, there's a 1% in there for uh, four sport athletes. That opportunity really doesn't present itself very well at the high school level, but the way the seasons are set up differently at the middle school level, that opportunity presents itself a little more. And really only presents, the way it most presents itself is um, in on, with goal sports, you can play softball, and then goals basketball starts a little bit later in the fall and goes into the start of the winter season, and then volleyball butts up to the end of basketball. So you can go softball, goals basketball, volleyball, and then track. And that's where we see that fourth sport typically come in. Any questions on the middle school? Here are the gate receipts for the middle school. We have five sports that we charge gate receipts for. Football, girls basketball, boys basketball, volleyball, and wrestling. Football, the numbers went up this year. Uh, this year. One of the things that was a little bit different this year with football is we had a couple of extra home events. We had one time where we were supposed to play an away game. We had bad weather, uh, and so we had to move it to a Tuesday night to play, and we played at our field instead. But because it was a Tuesday night school night, instead of playing seventh and eighth grade on this back to back like we would do on a Saturday, one Tuesday we played seventh grade, one Tuesday we played eighth grade. So there was a little bit more, in, uh, a few more opportunities to take game. Volleyball, uh, you see those numbers went up. And one of the reasons those numbers went up is because in the past we had not taken a game for the sixth grade. The sixth grade played right before the seventh and eighth grade. And we were noticing that a lot of people were coming into the gym during the sixth grade game. And so this year we decided to do, take a game, the sixth grade game as well, for games as well. So a couple additional updates for you. Uh, one, scoreboard. Uh, scoreboards are up and running. Uh, we've had a lot of positive feedback. I mean, one of the things that I uh, had it would have been great as, you know, the number of people come to say, I can hear your announcers. It, 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 it's been really great to hear the announcers. Uh, from a financial standpoint, all of our big board uh, uh, people and our, um, our MVP and our elite sponsors that we have, all those checks are in, uh, they've been deposited. Uh, our one, we have uh, an additional digital sponsor this year. One of the digital sponsors checks in, the other one is that corporate office being processed and should be in any, anytime soon. Uh, and then the only thing after that we'd be waiting on uh, boosters pays half in the spring and they play half after they have some concession money coming in the fall. So are we 100% sponsored? We still have a couple of vacancies that we're trying to fill. Okay. So I know that was one of my hanging points was we were supposed to be 100% sure. much before. The well, we're, yeah, I mean, we're still. So it, it may take six years instead of five to pay it off through sponsorship, but that doesn't mean that we won't be able to pay it off through sponsorship. It just means it won't be on that five-year plan because we still have an open opportunity for the sponsorship. So it would just be nice for everybody to put the effort forward that they would have put forward before we approved it to get it as 100% funded as possible. So we, we sent out a, a ton of information this, this spring, early summer to try and uh, solicit businesses um, to to take up those final spots. Okay, I mean, just, you need to keep hammering it. 
because we're still not where we should have been a year ago. Was it a year ago we got them? Yeah. So um, we are. I'm sorry. When um, when did the maintenance? Well, when does the warranty conclude? Is it a two-year warranty? Uh, or are we starting to pay a maintenance contract? No, it was a five-year warranty. I believe okay. off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'd have to go and look back through those notes, but um, it was five-year. So we don't really have any maintenance contract costs per se unless something, okay. Logo, I'll be speaking with you more on that a little bit later. Uh, Hall of Fame, uh, we, Hall of Fame was traditionally on a Sunday at the end of April. And so by the Hall of Fame committee, we, we discussed it and we decided to, to move the Hall of Fame this year to homecoming week. And the big reason for that is because when you go to that Hall of Fame banquet and you listen to the accomplishments of the people inducting the Hall of Fame, it's amazing. That being said, on a Sunday afternoon in April, the only people that were typically attending that banquet were primarily friends and family members of those being inducted. And we felt that it was very important to try and get, get their message to our students. So, uh, Doug Sinski is and I are working on an assembly where those people during homecoming week can come and actually get in front of our students and share their stories with our kids because we think it's very inspiring. And then we have an opportunity uh, on that Friday night of homecoming to then recognize those inductees at, at the football game and where we know um, that, that we have very, very good turnouts. We have a very good community turnout. So we want to put a spotlight on, on their successes. We're also going to give them a little coin that they get to keep. And then anytime they come to a game, they get to show their coin and they get a little token. <coughs> I already touched on the online season tickets. Um, basketball scheduling. Um, I wasn't at the last uh, meeting. Um, sorry, I assume there were some questions about basketball scheduling. So I wanted to address any of those questions that you may have, but I also wanted to let you know that um, we've been working pretty diligently to try and uh, come up with a more balanced schedule. Um, you know, we, we met um, and discussed the concerns about uh, some inequalities, um, and I know uh, th there were some things that were addressed, um, and that, that, like I said, feel free to ask questions. Like, I can tell you the overall approach that we're taking, I've, I've gone and I've talked at multiple meetings the CSA with other ADs about what can we do, what steps can we take to find some more balance. And the thing that is getting the most traction from those conversations is looking at, at ways to have double header nights um, where we would play both varsity games in one gym and both JV games in the other gym. So if we're playing boys basketball first, then we play the goal sophomore game in the other gym. Right? And then when it's time for the girls' varsity game, and then the boys' sophomore game is going on in the other gym. Um, so we sat down. Uh, we have another AD that does a lot of the schedule rotations. I sat down. I started working with him. Um, we put in a lot of hours. We took a couple days to work on it. I went over to Decatur, uh, sat down with him. For, and um, the new rotation doesn't start this year. It starts a year from now. And what we were able to do is we wanted to, first of all, we, it just makes sense to have more, uh, we wanted a completely balanced. <coughs> we wanted to play the same teams, uh, the same weeks throughout the course of the season. Um, there were some weeks where we were playing one conference game and not two conference games. And, and so we tried to find, we tried to make it so we're playing two conference games every week. Uh, one of the big challenges we face are the city tournaments. In the city, if, if there were no city tournaments, it would be easy to say, okay, we've got, uh, we play each team twice, we play everybody round robin, all, nine, all 10 teams. The first half of the season, turn around and flip home and away and play on the second half of the season. And we could pair it up and match it up, and that'd be great. Um, but because of the season tournaments for the Springfield schools, or the city tournaments, and they the boys and the girls are on different dates, it, it throws that off. So we're able to match up, I think, seven, seven different 
scenario of games where we would play common opponents, the boys and the girls. And then the next thing we had to look at was, okay, Rochester, if we're playing Rochester, we can do this. Whether we're home or away, they've got the gym space, we've got the gym space to play the double headers. Now, not every school has that. About half of the schools in our conference have the ability to play two games simultaneously, about half do not. <coughs> Um, just because they will have one gym. Because they have one gym, yeah. So then, so we, we look at some of the complexities that went along with that. Basically, when it all boiled down, we, we found three or four dates with Glenwood in 2020-21 uh, to do these double header games. And I think when we do those double header games, then we would, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've been meeting all year about trying to find ways to get band more involved. Dr. Wood, I'll tell you. But um, we can, with those double headers, that even creates more of those opportunities to get band playing for, for both both teams. Um, so it, it is it is being worked on. Um, you know, it's. I know one of the comments um, that I read through the notes was about um, playing one team at home while the other team is on the road. Um, and it is, that, that's that been met with, uh, I, I honestly, I don't think the coach wants to do that. Uh, I, I, we, personally, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that because I don't want to split our fan base between having to choose to go on the road to watch some of our kids or stay at home and watch some of our kids. So if we don't have to do that, we want to try not to have to do that. <laughs> Questions? In, in that last example, you, you mean to when, when, for example, the boys' basketball team is playing on a Friday night, mm -hmm. you would want a, the girls' basketball team to also be playing on a Friday night at home if the boys are away. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, whatever night it is. Yes. Um, the other thing I asked the conference about was um, Saturdays, Saturday games. And so what the the conference has told me is uh, uh, this was before I before I became a better director. There was. Um, they had adjusted the, the schedule and they had gone to the IHSA because they wanted to be Title IX compliant. So they, they asked the IHSA about goals games on Saturdays and the IHSA's response to them was playing on a Saturday is considered a prime, technically Title IX doesn't use the word prime time, but it's a prime time game, a uh, day. That, um, so they consider Saturday the, the day to meet the Title IX requirements. So, one more question. When the girls play on Saturday, do they play, I don't know the terminology, is it the big gym or the small gym? They, they play in the big gym. Oh, they play in the big yeah. gym. Yeah. We, we had one situation this year where they, they played in a small gym, and it was one we tried to avoid. Um, and looking back on it, um, we've got a great opportunity for a double header, and I wish we'd done that. Um, and, uh, you know, I appreciate the, the suggestions to think more about that because I think it's a good idea. And, and so that's what we're working on, trying to do more of that. In, in the and I know those basketball schedules are probably set well in advance of the season. Mm -hmm. So, as of right now, we already have the night, the nineteen. Oh yeah, yeah we we set the twenty twenty one. So that's what we're, we're, I see. we're trying to oh. work on that. Okay. So they're set they're set well in advance. Mm -hmm. of the season. Um, I think one other thing that was was maybe brought up in you know, um, Chile, um, you know, participating. It, it, more football events. So I'm always cautious, and I, and I, and I bring this up because uh, I don't want our cheerleaders to be felt like they are um, uh, cheerleaders are their own sport, and, and they have this schedule, which is is the boys' schedule, and it's it's not as easy as just saying let's have the cheerleaders just add more to their schedule, or. I, what we want to do is we want to find opportunities to elevate the programs that we to make sure everybody's everything's equitable. Um, what we don't want to do is um, try and take away from one program. And I don't want to. I, I want to be very cautious and, and think uh, long and hard before we tell a team that uh, is, is uh, like our Chile team that is going on the road uh, to compete. Uh, and perform in, in opponent's gyms, so that now we want you to just stay home all the time and only perform in our games so that you can perform for both boys and girls. There's a lot of challenges there, and it's things that we're, we're talking about and looking into and, and trying to figure out what's best, but it is, um, 
I don't want to, I don't want to just to add a whole nother season to those kids play the season. Does that make sense? So I'm assuming you're everybody's talking. So if the cheerleaders want to extend themselves farther, they might be provided that opportunity, but I want to assume that they don't, right? I mean, you just, you, I'm assuming that cheerleading coach is involved in the discussions too, as you're all figuring out ways to get everybody. Yeah, and and, they, and not to tell you, our cheerleading coaches are open to, to doing some, to adding some games. Adding a full schedule is, is overwhelming, but they're, they're open to adding some games. Right, and I'm not suggesting yeah. I don't know anything about uh, handling anything with the sports, but it just sounded like you were making the assumption that they didn't want to participate in additional stuff, and I don't, I think they would want to be a part of the conversation, and I'm assuming they are. Oh, yeah. Football districts updates. Um, the, you've heard a lot of the news about districts, and districts are um, not going to happen for two more years. And quite honestly, there's, there's not a lot to talk about yet with districts because there are a lot of schools out there right now that are unhappy with the direction of districts. And so I think there's going to be a lot of proposals between now and then. So it's too early to really give you much information on districts because. I would, I would not be surprised if there's another vote this year on whether or not it's going to be the idea of this year. Well, I did have one question. First of all, I would just say congratulations on the success in oh. the results of people for yourself. So um, you, should, you should be very proud as well as all the people you think in your presentation, all the athletes. Um, my only remaining question would be, how does the athletic department, if, if they do, track academic success within their uh, student athletes? So, for example, in college, oftentimes you hear, you know, they they have a like team GPA and they track that over time to make sure that, you know, not only are they good athletes, but they're just doing a great job. And, and, you know, that's kind of the definition of a true student. Do we track that kind of metric? And if so, uh, what is it and how would we? Well, we don't track the team GPA. What we do is we, we track, uh, obviously we're eligibility reports every week. So we're, we're tracking eligibility, uh, and then we do, uh, in my more detailed report I did put down there under the team summaries, the number of academic all-conference student athletes we have for each sport. So that is something that we can track. Uh, the CSA, we do have an academic could you just, and I've heard this before, but I just don't have to correct my mind, what the academic standard is. I mean, so you can either be eligible or ineligible, and obviously those reports are running each week, I take it, during the season. Is it different in middle school versus high school? It is what different, is yes. Okay, I thought so in, in high school, uh, the IHSA requirements are that you pass five classes. Okay? In the middle school, you have to pass all your classes. And then there are semester requirements in, in high school as well. Uh, we follow the IHSA bylaws, but in addition to passing five classes per semester in order to be eligible for the next semester, remember we also expect a 1.7 GPA, and that's that's in addition to the IHSA bylaws. Which is a D plus, right? It, it's not a high bar necessarily, um, but. That, <coughs> was determined. I, I yeah. can be honest. I, I don't, I'm not sure when or how that, that number came about. 3.0C, right? No, 5, 4, 3. No, yeah. or 4.0C. Oh, 4.0C. Oh, yeah. Okay. 4, so 3, two. 2. That's that's 2 is a C. So that's 1.7 and that's 1 plus. <laughs> But we're also, but we're also, we're also talking about uh, what we think is the point of educational athletics, and 
and we think the point of education on athletics is to provide a resource for student student athletes because we feel like what they do with our coaches and with our teams is a, a valuable environment for them. And we'll often see that those kids do better while participating in sports than when they're not in sports. So I would hate to set that bar so high that, that those kids that really truly need it are being excluded from it.
and currently you see that there have been a number of logos that have been out there um, being used by various teams for various groups. In addition to that, you have groups PTOs, other groups that have also used uh, different variations, and these are just a few of them. Our recommendation is to use the block G for our official Paul Chatham logo, and in so doing, also adopt the branding guide that is give you a little bit of idea of, of all the steps and for, for those members of the board that are newer to this process. Back in uh, the 2016-17 school year, uh, the district started the strategic planning initiative. And it wasn't directly part of that project, but it sparked the conversation. And so uh, to carry on that conversation, uh, we started talking to our coaches. And in that coaches meeting, uh, basically we agreed that it would be beneficial to us to have a, a consistent unifying initiative that we would collect in what years. So we formed a committee uh, made up of faculty members, administration, students, and community members, and we got to work. And we brought in, we started asking questions about uh, who we are as Titans, and what do we want to be, and what does this look like? We created a community survey that we sent out in the summer of 2017 uh, and in that survey, we had over 300 responses to open any questions about what it is to be a Titan. And so we took that information and we started working with an artist um, based on the goals that we gathered from the survey and from the committee work. Goals of creating something that's unifying, creating something that recognizes the past while moving forward, that recognizes the diversity of our district, academics, athletics, and the arts, something that would be gender neutral, we also considered the uniqueness of the design. And we talked about whether or not uh, we should have a real image of a Titan. And I gotta say that, that's a hard one. And, and we had a lot of uh, long conversations and it, it's hard to identify what does a, what, what does a Titan really look like. Um, so we went into that next year, we worked with artists, we had some corrections, uh, creations. Uh, we came up with a design. Uh, we did give some board updates uh, on, on the process at that time. Then we sent out a second survey to about 85 people, including uh, the president of the PTOs, and boosters, and board members, and directors, and, and coaches, and administration. And based on that second survey, we decided to develop a second design option. Uh, we developed the second design option. We then surveyed, we went through that process uh, we felt like uh, we had positive feedback on it, so then we created another survey. Uh, that survey went out in two stages. One went to students and faculty and staff, and we had about 1,000 responses. Another one went out to uh, the community, and we had about 1,300 responses. Overall, the top option got about 44% of the overall vote of the three options we, we put on there for them to choose from. That was brought to the board last summer, and the board tabled it in favor of gathering even more community feedback, uh, which ultimately um, led us to this, which I think is, is where we should have gotten to. I mean, ultimately, I think what we have now is, um, is something that we can all unite behind. It's something that um, has history, but it, it's also um, something that, you know, we. We recognize the teams and groups and organizations, they all have their own individual identity, but it doesn't mean we want to live in silos. We do want to come together, we want to be unified, we're all Titans. And so I think with, with our, our new design, and I skipped ahead just a little bit, I think, uh, I think we can get to, I think we're at that point. So after we tabled it, we, uh, took the fall off and we reconvened the committee in the winter. We added more committee members, uh, including more community members. Uh, and we decided to go out and get some community designs. And so we opened it up, asked for feedback from the community, had them submit designs. Uh, we had 186 designs submitted for the deadline. And we got a ton of designs from the fifth and sixth grade art classes. That was awesome. And uh, then we sat down as a committee and we really tried to identify the top ones that we could send out to the community for even further feedback. And through that whole conversation, 
nothing stuck. The only thing that was stuck and was galvanizing was the block of cheese. And we, we had a, a strong feeling that whatever we did, we could center around the block of cheese. But those other designs, those other features, we, we just couldn't get to a place where we felt comfortable sending anything out to the, commi uh, the community for further feedback because we weren't comfortable with it to begin with. So we decided that we get some consultant help to see what the next step was. We had the block G, but we didn't have anything else. Did we need something else? And so Justin stepped in, and uh, Justin, who has a, a relationship with us through things like the gowns and the rings and those kind of things, and they offered to uh, provide us with a consultant that they use uh, with no charge to the district. And uh, so after some trying to get some communication with consultant, it took a while. Dr. Wood and the consultant finally touched base and it took a lot longer than expected, but the reality was his, what he wanted us to do, we would really already done. And so we felt like in order to move forward, we needed to move forward. We sat back down with um, the committee uh, right after school got out. Um, and through that process, we had a lot of natural adoption of the Block G. We had, you know, if you remember a few months ago, the, the band uniforms that were here with the Block G on that became board approved. We had a lot of teams using the Block G. We had other groups using the Block G as well. It's really um, just kind of naturally become something that people have really kind of gotten behind. And so because of that, we get to recommend the Block G for our logo. So this is the primary logo, it's the block G with an outline. You see it both the red on a white background and white on a red background. A couple of things I'll take you through real quick with the branding guide. We recommended logo modifications. Uh, so the reason we put this on here is because we understand that uh, there's not, not for every situation does an outline necessarily work. Sometimes it'll work better than other times. So it gives the user the flexibility to alter or modify or remove the outline in order to enhance their appearance on, on that particular medium that they're using. We also wanted to make sure that we were clear on restrictions. And so I'll just read this to you. No additional imagery can be placed directly on any approved Glenwood logo. Approved supplemental in imagery can be around or behind approved Glenwood images, but no direct touching of lines between Glenwood images and secondary images. Additional imagery may be approved by the logo committee. So the top example is one that would be approved, uh, the stamp of our logo on something like a baseball. The bottom one, where they've taken our G and then they've put laces over the top of it, that would not be approved. It's important that we have our recommended colors. I think one of the things that's challenging is matching reds. So by identifying our specific color of red, uh, it, it creates uniformity. Black and gray are on there as accent colors. And our, our, our school colors are red and white. We're not recommending that we change from our school colors being red and white, but it's important that we have, we know that those accent colors are there. And this just shows the G in some different backgrounds. Also have the recommended font here. And so the G is, is based off of, if you, if you go through and look, it's, it really matches somewhat to the, a font called Academic M54. So this is a modified version of it that's Titan M54, but it is unique enough that it's our version of the font. So if I'm gonna to go to Word document and look up that on the font, I'm not gonna You're not gonna find it. it. <laughs> Actually, um, we, we created an extension in Illustrator where now we can have that font where I can I could share it with you, and you could add that to Word and now have it as a font. But no, it's not a really mm -hmm. font. And then we have a, a secondary one. Now, the secondary one is, is a, just a regular font. Some more examples of, of the G. We just wanted to, you know, we want to have the block G, and everything is still the block G, but we also wanted to give people the ability to have some flexibility um, even within the G. So really, you could have the black G with 
or without the outline. Mm -hmm. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And we and we see that already in, in, in different mm -hmm. situations. And we also put some sample text on ways you could use the block G with some of our our uh, lettering. Uh, up there, you've, you've got you know, Glenwood, you've got Ball Elementary, um, you've got the banners, so you see Ball and then that we would consider a banner as elementary, so you could you could change that. It could be uh, Glenwood Band, uh, for example. Uh, here's a couple other, uh, just a closer examples. So in the first example, I have Titan Athletics, and the second example, I have GMS Titans. So that'd be an example of the flexibility you would have. Then a couple of points of clarification. Secondary logos. That's that a big. Uh, that's that a big conversation. Multiple conversations. School organizations will be allowed to continue to use the secondary images, but those images cannot overlap with block G. So if you wanted to use that lightning bolt, it could be used with the block G, but it can't go over the top of the block G. Uh, natural identifiers. So a basketball, a baseball. Those would be natural identifiers. Uh, we'll also be allowed uh, any new secondary logos would be committee approval. And then the previous board approved logos, uh, now they have the T with Linwood across it, uh, and then the, the GT, um, which has been used a lot throughout the district, uh, will be phased out over time. This is not an immediate removal type of situation. So as, as things uh, need replacing over time, that's when we replace them.
Okay, so 8.2, uh, <coughs> opportunity for visitors to address the school board concerning any topic. I have had a question about the agenda of meeting dates, excuse me. Um, the, the beginning of the year breakfast, that's not a, that's not a meeting of board meeting. No, okay.
I, and I think it also um, will prevent any misperception, um, either in at a board meeting or via email um, to board members that there's so much turnover, so much activity, um, because you know the assumption is, is that uh, teachers are not necessarily satisfied with uh, working with the district and for the district. And what the detail shows is that there are many, many different reasons why um, teachers uh, depart from the district. So <coughs> thank you very much. This is really good. You're welcome. Okay. Um, adjournment of the regular meeting. Um, so thank you. Second. <laughs> Great. Aye. We take a vote here. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All votes. Aye. 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 Aye.